This is ThinkTech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon and welcome to Trump Week. I'm your guest host, Carl Campagna. Um, today we're going to talk about media. Today we're going to talk about news and fake news in particular uh, in this era of Trump. So that's really where we're going to go. We're going to discuss a number of different issues and with regards to, I guess, truth and fact, maybe not truth as much as fact, uh, and, and how we take in the information and, and some of the challenges that we have before us within this, this I guess, era of Trump that we have. Uh, problematic in many ways. And to really help me understand this, uh, actually, I really am thrilled uh, to welcome to the show uh, Mr. Brett Obergaard, uh, who is, well, I'll let him explain uh, everything that he is, uh, but I'm, I'm quite thrilled. Uh, coming from the University of Hawaii Department of Communications, uh, to talk with us about journalism and what that means with regards to media in this, in this time uh, of Trump. So welcome to the show, uh, Brett. I know you've been on uh, other shows before here with Jay. Uh, first time we're, we're meeting and talking, but I greatly appreciate the opportunity to learn what I can. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Excellent. So, okay, um, media in the era of Trump. What we've got is a, a lot of disparate information all over the place. <laughs> we've got a lot of uh, facts and non-facts, issues that people are having a hard time really understanding uh, or really knowing where to turn uh, and, and what to believe. And I think that's the biggest problem we have. Um, I personally think that that's by design. I think that's being done intentionally uh, to confuse us, so therefore we can't get in the way. Um, that's my opinion. But um, if you would, first of all, start by telling, about, telling us and this audience about, about yourself and about what you do, and then we'll jump into what it really means with regards to media today and maybe you know, uh, as we think forward. So tell us a bit about yourself. Okay, well, I'm an associate professor at the University of Hawaii, and I teach uh, journalism classes, including the capstone journalism class. And my uh, research expertise is in media technologies. So I'm really interested in the medium and how uh, different messages get, um, you know, changed by the medium. Okay, excellent. Okay, okay. okay so I, I would imagine then you spend time working on social media. Uh, social media is not my expertise, but uh, I, I work mostly with mobile media. Mobile and, media. Yeah, and uh, you know, social media is a whole different thing. Like, okay. <laughs> but I am familiar with it. And I do understand uh, the basics of it. Okay. 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 Yeah. All right. So, as far as mobile media, help me understand what you mean there. Uh, well, in uh, 2007, we had this miraculous device that came into our uh, consciousness, the iPhone, that basically uh, change the way people communicate in dramatic ways. And okay. it's the fastest diffusing technology, communication technology in human history, the smartphone is. The smartphone so, along, along with all of the various applications out there that provide the opportunity to do like real time, this is what's happening with my camera phone. Right, but I mean just the hardware, Okay. Yeah. People have like you have a phone in your pocket. Yeah. I have one in mine. Probably everybody watching right. has one in theirs. And That's right. uh, it's it's uh, really changed a lot about humanity. Okay. I I think it has. Mm -hmm. Do you think? And it's affected you, the way even we understand politics too, in the sense that things are crunched down into these you know 140 character messages, uh, or. Uh, you know, Facebook posts or whatever that really aren't vetted in the way they were before. Um, and before the smartphone, there wasn't easy access to social media. Like, That's think if true. you had to go to your desktop computer and log into Facebook and do it, and most people wouldn't do that. Yeah, if you, <laughs> if you had a thought that you can condense into 140 characters but had to run across town to get to your lab, get to your desktop in order to type a thought in, you're not going to do that very often. You're not going to do that, and the people didn't. Yeah, and what changed it was the smartphone. Yeah, and all of a sudden everything is okay, and I'm going to comment on this. Reply here's to that. my food picture. Here's you know <laughs> my rant. Here's you know yeah, what, yeah, yeah. whatever whatever my selfie. I, I tend to do more rants than food <laughs> pictures myself, but okay. I have some food pictures. Yeah, and family. Yeah. So <laughs> all right, so excellent. Um, so okay, let's 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 get a different context in here. Um, before the show, you and I were talking uh, about a range of things, but one of the things that came up was the idea of uh, journalistic ide uh, ideology, mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, and specifically uh, as the overarching thought with integrity uh, as well. 
Uh, that's one of the biggest challenges that I think we have right now is, is what we've got is a president and an entire party that seems to be talking about, you know, it, not to always make everything about this party versus that party, but it seems to be one party and one president in particular who is pushing this idea of what's fake news versus not fake news. And that's only muddying up what was already a confusion landscape of what's going on in the world. Um, so with that in mind, uh, what, what, are, what are some thoughts that you have? Or, or, or let's, let's, let's discuss this idea of uh, journalistic integrity and, and, and ideology. Um, what can you tell us from, from a university perspective anyway with regards to this? Well, I'll, uh, I'll step back just a bit and say that um, you, you know, the Republican Party, for the most part, has not chanted fake news at people, and, and, but, they, but they have not stood up to Trump either. Right. So I think it's a little bit unfair to um, put them in the same uh, ballpark. Now, they're, 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 they're complicit in a lot of ways, but I would say that they're not um, doing the same kind of bullying tactics for the most part. There are some people like in Montana, you had the um, uh, legislator who body slammed a reporter and, right. and th these kinds of things have happened and they're definitely concerning. But I would say for the most part, the Republican Party is, is, is more um, guilty of being complicit. And, and, and it's been a growing thing. I mean, yeah. I, I, what I hear echoed in the back of my mind is, is mainstream media being like an evil thing. Uh, and that being talked right. about. And and most of them don't say that out loud. They may think it, or they may support it. But, yeah. um, but uh, Trump is a completely different character. He, yeah. he has um, continually surprised me. I've, I've never seen anything like him in American history. Um, you see, him, see characters like him all the time in banana republics and uh, dictatorships around the world. But uh, I, before he was elected, I truly thought America would never allow something like this to happen. And, and now here he is, so we and, have to deal with him. Exactly. Well, in many, in many ways, in many interpretations of it, that was the purpose of the Electoral College. The right. purpose of the Electoral College was to prevent someone quite like this from mm -hmm. getting through. But clearly, going back to the idea of ideology, there was a specific ideology that was willing to allow it. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, electoral college should be abolished immediately. It has it has no purpose anymore. Yeah, I, and I agree. And it's a complete fraud. I agree. So, I, agree. Um, I mean, that to me is is a it's just an obvious step that we should take in in the evolution of our democracy is to get rid of this uh, farcical electoral college. Which you can understand at the time that it was created, and that's where, where we have to look at things from the perspective of of historical place and time. It had and its time. It's had, it had its place. It it's had its time anymore. and its place, but yeah. it doesn't, it's not needed anymore because we have such a media uh, access everywhere through our phones. I can, at any given minute of any day, every given second of every day, I can access something. So the purpose of the Electoral College was to make sure that there were opportunities and that we were representing a number of people uh, that may not have access to all of the news in a certain way, and that was part of the, part of the original uh, formation of that. Well, we're not there anymore because we have not just the technologies, but, but all of the abilities through our constitution to be able to make sure that we've got this there. Now, the it's one- It's also really disappointing to imagine that your vote is like 3,000 times less valuable than somebody's vote in you know, Iowa or something. And, and that's the truth, and that's actually the debate isn't it? That's the debate. Mm -hmm. So the reason we have the Electoral College is so that someone in Hawaii, where we have very few people, you know, comparative to others, our vote is supposed to mean more because of the Electoral College. We have three whole electoral votes <laughs> as opposed to 57 that another state may have or, or more. Um, but in effect, what, that's, what that does is, is it, it's almost the reverse effect, and that we're giving more power to a smaller grouping of people in some cases uh, than others. Um, and it's a smaller group in uh, areas of less uh, importance in our country's overall scheme. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, North Dakota or South Dakota, those, those people don't have important lives. What I'm saying is if uh, the economy of North Dakota collapsed, it would not destroy the... the uh, the country like if the economy of California collapsed. 
Uh, there's probably truth in that, but I think the people in Dakotas will take issue with that. Well, maybe. <laughs> Luckily, there's not very many of them. <laughs> well, um, but yeah, but that's one of the, that's one of the keys to the whole principle and the argument against making any changes to it is we want to make sure that we are giving the smaller states, smaller populous states, as as much power in some ways, um, maybe more power is what it feels like in in some instances. But that's a very important debate that we need to have. Um, but going back to uh, going back to journalism and going back to the idea of of media right now, what there's so many different facets going on. Now, uh, the, earlier we were talking about okay, there there are bubbles, uh, there are media bubbles, what they call it a bubble, an echo chamber. You've got you've got some media outlets that seem to cater to one thought process or ideology versus another, and what 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 are you I, I don't know what what are your thoughts on on some of those concerns or or maybe how that has come about? Um, well, people have abdicated their responsibility um, in in many ways to to the media organizations of the past, like uh, Cronkite or or whatever, where if he said it, it was true. Walter Cronkite. Yeah. Um, and what they really should have been doing is build their own media literacy to be able to understand the way um, journalism works and the validity of pieces of journalism and not trust a particular person but trust their own process in understanding media and uh, the content in it. And I think that a lot of politicians in particular rely on people not fully understanding or having the time. Well, that's the uh, political platform of Trump is rely on me, anything I say is true, anything anybody else says is false, yeah, exactly. and you don't have to do any thinking. And he's come out blatantly to say that. Yeah, I'm, the, I'm the one person Many who times. can solve this problem. No one else can solve this the way that I can, he says. Um, and, and then labeling everybody as fake media. Mm -hmm. You're fake news. Mm -hmm. and therefore, you're irrelevant. Well, how, do we, how can we, what, what, is, what is some advice you may have for us to think about this media literacy idea um, and how we can better assess what is fake news and what isn't fake news? Well, it starts with taking personal responsibility, that you don't just um, bring in everything that's given to you and, ex and accept it as gospel. You have to um, examine everything that crosses your path, especially in social media, and think carefully about where did this come from, why, do these, uh, why is this story written this way, what are its biases, how does this affect my understanding of the story, and most importantly, where can I find uh, independent sources that would potentially contradict this. So if you think of it in terms of a dialectical process where if you put all the ideas together and the truth comes out of the mix, then that's uh, what every individual should strive for. Now realistically, people don't you know, spend eight hours a day analyzing their media, and that's why they rely so much on their friends to do that kind of vetting. But um, you know, friends and family aren't doing that, so it's really on you to make sure that you understand what's going on before you uh, fervently believe it. And that's why tweets are popular, because it's 140 characters of information that you kind of absorb, consume, and move on. Well, the tweets are a perfect propaganda tool, and um, the, I would say the, the ideal way to use Twitter would be a headline and a link to more information. If you don't have the link, then it's propaganda because it's just just like skimming the, hand, the headlines. You, do, yeah. you don't have any understanding of what the yeah. what the sentiment is. So that's sort of a so, um, so Mexico is going to build the wall, you, you know, and you're not getting the link to explain. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? And uh, yeah. then then you're falling into propaganda. Yeah, absolutely. That's mm -hmm. And that's actually a huge concern that we have uh, these days. Now, but part of that is, and we're going to go to a break in a second. But part of that is also the difference between investigative journalism and opinion pieces. Uh, so we're going to go to a break, and when we come back, I, I, I'll try to explore that a little bit if we can. Okay. So um, thank you for joining us. This is Trump Week, and I'm your guest host today, Carl Campagna. I will see you in one minute. Thank you again to our guest today, um, Mr. Brett Opgard, and uh, we will see you in one minute. Thanks. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch, hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. 
Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff, MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never drive. <laughs> welcome back to Trump Week. I'm your guest host, Carl Campagna, and welcome once again to the show, uh, Professor Brett Opegard from the University of Hawaii Department of Communication. Is that correct? Right. Excellent. All right. Um, welcome again, and thank you. Thank you. So we were just talking about uh, the idea of opinion pieces versus investigative journalism, and uh, and one of the things that you said earlier as well. Well, you know, it starts with taking personal responsibility. That all kind of comes together a little bit when you think about it as. I don't have enough time in my day to take the personal responsibility to vet out something that somebody has said or written. But you know what? I believe, I agree with almost everything that that person that keeps tweeting these things says. So I'm just going to keep following them and I'm just going to get all of my information from them and, and then I'll just repeat what they say and I'll sound smart. That's, that's where we are right now. That's where we live right now. So how do we... How do we how do we address that, or what can we do? How can what possibly can we do? I, I don't think you have an answer to this. I don't think anybody has an answer to well, that. I'll try. Moment. I'll start with the idea that you, if you don't have time to figure it out, then you're making time to be confused and misinformed. So um, I, I think that's a false reasoning. Okay. Uh, also, we've always had thought leaders in our communities. You know, presidents, senators, whatever, business leaders. Um, you know, philanthropists. Uh, but we haven't had the um, power that social media creates before, yeah. where your message can literally be circulated among every human on the globe and in, in instantaneously. Yeah. So that is, uh, to me, a, a really a threat, a propaganda threat that um, we have to face yeah. with action, not passively sitting around waiting for somebody to figure it out for us. And if you go by the 80-20 rule, which a lot of people do. 80% of the people will just go along with what you say and 20% will investigate. Well, 80% of the people are just listening to what someone, some thought leader is saying and because they have a particular idealism that they agree with, they're just going to go with that. And that's how we have such a division in the country at the moment. And that is represented, I think that's echoed in these bubbles or these echo chambers that we have as far as Infowars, Breitbart, and all of the conservative alt-right media versus MSNBC and all of the, you know, maybe you include CNN and that, and all these other what is considered more leftist opinions. So again, going back to this idea of what is an opinion, what is an op-ed versus a real piece of journalism? And that goes back to one of the earlier thoughts was, was journalistic ide you know, ideology. What should a journalist be doing? Well, the ideology is, includes opinion and includes um, all sorts of things. It includes reviews, it includes investigative pieces, it includes service journalism, like when the festival is and how do you get there and how much you pay. So I want to make sure to not make a binary that's investigative or nothing. But what I will say is that um, in the history of journalism, you have uh, you know an arc basically that started with individual printers printing political news of whatever they wanted. There was no code of ethics or validity or accountability for what they printed. And um, eventually that transformed into the objectivity that we now think of as modern journalism, but that wasn't until you know the early 1900s. And then we went through a period where um, journalists started to think of themselves in more literary terms and we had a literary journalism movement where we started to see more storytelling journal journalism 
And uh, in, in the last few decades, we've had a real battle between objectivity and what's called advocacy journalism, or when you argue for a particular position. Okay. And the uh, advocacy uh, journalists have you know, you know, basically contested objective truth and said there's no such thing as objective truth, which you, you can make an argument for that, but if we don't have common ground truths, uh, which we apparently don't have in this particular presidential administration, then we have no where we can stand and actually talk to each other. And that is that is the biggest problem that we have is is we do have a lack of trust. And I, I think this this was manufactured is, mm -hmm. is what it appears to manufactured over a period of time, not just Trump, uh, but going back in time, manufactured to this disbelief. And at this point, there's been a discrediting of the media, a discrediting of the intelligence communities, a discrediting of science, to the point where all of those people that you're used to having the, you know, having answers or going to for answers, we don't trust them anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, this this started with deregulation in the mid '90s, and that led to the rise of uh, right-wing radio, Rush Limbaugh, and those types of characters which then led to the television version, Fox News, and that's their whole shtick was we're going to counter uh, the mainstream media and tell you how they're lying or fake or wrong, and that's how they made all their money. Yeah, you know, definitely. by skepticism. It's actually cynicism, not skepticism. Cynicism, skepticism is yeah. very healthy. Cynicism, very unhealthy. And it, it, I think we've, we've uh, passed this very... Um, terrible threshold where most people are cynical now about everything. about everything and then we can't come back together to get get um, common problems solved yeah um, and that's because the division the gap between the sides and unfortunately there are there are two there's more than two there really are more than two sides mm -hmm. within the Republican Party there are many different factions mm -hmm. there are more extreme conservatives and there are more moderates and there's everyone in between same thing on the Democratic side up until the last, well, decade, we'll say, really, or so, that division hasn't been as much of a problem because everyone has understood, okay, you know what, it's that middle ground, it's those moderates, we need the people on the extremes to help the conversation along a little bit, but the compromise is what people lead to, as compromise is what's going to actually be the most beneficial, where we'll all come to a final agreement. Well, those compromises aren't happening anymore because the extremes, because of this media direction, because of this advocacy media that has been driving one direction or the other, the division has just widened, and the mistrust and the cynicism has increased. Mm -hmm. What do we do? Well, we rebuild what's uh, the metaphor that Buber uses is the narrow ridge between us. So there's, if you think of a, a path, and on each side is a chasm, where people are down in, in uh, cynicism land. And there's a narrow ridge between us where you can come and um, you know, coexist. Uh, that's what we need to be rebuild. We need to find that ground where we can stand face to face and agree on certain things, disagree philosophically, but make some compromise for, the, for everyone to have a better life. Won't that require some of those thought leaders to open the doors to those pathways? It, I think it um, could require that or it could require a, a revolt of its the followers. You know, thought leaders only as powerful as the followers, which is, um, you know, part of the issue with Trump is that he's in a position that we can't really ignore him. Uh, if he was in any other position like the charlatan real estate developer position or whatever he was, he was, <laughs> which is you, what could, he's good at. you could ignore him, you know, <laughs> right. and who cares, but when he's, the president of the United States with um, nothing between him and a nuclear war, nothing, then yeah. we can't ignore him. And Agreed. And, and this was a, a conversation we were having earlier before we got on air, and, and I think it was an important conversation. Um, I, you were suggesting that, well, you know, if we ignore him, it could get worse. And I immediately said, well, well, how much worse can we get? And you came up with some really good points. How much worse can it get? Yes, nuclear war. But not just nuclear war. There are, there are many levels. There's going to martial law. There's, uh, and once we do that, we, what you suggested was once we go to martial law, then, then that means we abandon the whole electoral process and election mm -hmm. cycles. 
Well, it's part of the uh, fascist playbook is to discredit elections. Yeah, which then, has also been done. Then you get appointments, yeah. and then the appointments are, you know, your appointments. Which is, in his and, case, his family. Yeah, yeah. And this is not... This is not something that Trump invented. This is the fascist playbook. So that's what we have to be wary of. And I, as we have that conversation, and as I try to engage people in that conversation, if you are not, if you're of the ideology or of the mindset that you're just going to believe or just allow Trump and whatever he does and is to exist because somehow he's a conduit to achieving your ideological values, you're opening the door to allowing that type of fascism to for this whole playbook which can be shown it is directly out of hitler's playbook everything that has happened the whole discrediting of everything we just mentioned not just hitler stalin not just hitler, stalin. i mean i would say it's a playbook it's exactly. not a, it's not you can't just trace it to germany right. not just it, one. yeah right this exactly is, this is a standard operating procedure for people who want to claim power so the only way, so those, the people, the followers have to be let down in order for them to pull away. Well, they have to open their eyes. Well, if they, they have to want to open their eyes. <laughs> and the only way they want to open their eyes is because, wait a minute, that didn't happen the way I thought it was going to happen. Some of that might be happening now. Some people, there are reports that some of his support has been dwindling because he hasn't done this or is doing that. Uh, and they weren't expecting that uh, because he promised one thing or another. So maybe some of that is going to happen. Uh, so perhaps the opportunity for 2018 and 2020 to make the changes that are important for the health of the country. It's not about the health of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party or parties. It's the health of the country is what it seems to be. And, and in my opinion, we really need journalists. We really need the media to be one of the beacons that's there saying, pointing the way, saying, by the way, here's this and here's that, and here's some different thoughts, and here's a different ways of thinking about this. And yes, it's true, this is a playbook, and this is how this playbook has been played out in the past, and by these, and here's some comparisons. Not saying that's what he's doing, but you know what? Let's be mindful of it. And we need more of that to try to cross that gap, right? Well, it's no coincidence, I think, that. Uh Trump has risen in a time when the newspaper business model collapsed. News, newspapers were the um, foundation of, I, I would say, intellectual um, activity in the country before the, um, basically the business model collapsed. Yeah. We still have, of course, television news, but um, often that's just based on you, you know what's on the screen not really listening to the content so that's interesting so going back to yeah you know, we, we're, we're about 20 seconds out uh, to end the show here but it comes back to what you're saying is the technology of of our media these days the technology and the opportunities that we have have actually created have created a void right have created a void mm -hmm. have broken down mm -hmm. the belief structures and and the and the I guess the the common person the everyday person just believing what is in the media mm -hmm. it, it's it's one of the pieces is there's this, it's so disparate in so many different places you pick up whatever you want whatever you tend to believe with is what you're going to continue to go with so that's huge discussion yeah huge it got issue. commoditized essentially it, what happened and yeah. with when it became a commodity then it didn't have any value anymore which is a problem so i in my opinion the corporatization of everything is the destruction of everything in many ways so thank you so much uh, thank sorry you. sorry I, there's so much more we can get to but, yeah. but thank you so much well, that was a good uh, start <laughs> have you come back and we can dig in more uh, at another time so thank you for joining us this is trump week um i'm your guest host carl campagna jay fidel will be back next week uh he actually may be back shortly and uh, with another show coming up probably in about 10 15 minutes uh we will see you next week uh, just really trying to tackle the issues that are going on uh, these days with this administration. So thank you for joining us, and thank you to our guest today, Professor Brett Opegard. Yeah, I'm saying it correctly. That was a good pause. Uh, <laughs> from the <laughs> University of Hawaii, <laughs> Department of Communication. Thank you. See you next week.